Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to start the program. Please continue to enjoy your meal and do drink those wonderful wine. I know Genevieve would love to see everything that's enjoying our wine of the month. Uh, again, welcome to FCC. My name is Joe Pan, journalist governor, and today I'll be moderating uh, gentlemen that you all know well, either have been with him during the trip and the trek in Great War or have seen his stories published online or actually watch on BBC, uh, a fellow journalist and who has taken a different path in conservationists and also one of the field guests we have, speakers we have for the year that make the claim of tracking the Great War multiple times and producing not only 11 books along the way, but also known for his work and being awarded for Friendship Award, one of the highest honor as a foreigner in China, and also his title of OBE, and you all know well what that means. And so with that, I want to welcome Willing Lindsay to our last club lunch of the year. So if you don't know, we often hold club lunch multiple times over the month, and this is the last of the year, and so great to have you. Uh, along the way for today, we're gonna have Mr. William Lindsay to present his wonderful presentation with a lot of photos, you, uh, taking you to a journey to places you've never seen before about the Great Wall, and we hope to learn a little bit more and asking a few questions, but mainly from you guys to ask questions we otherwise would not be able to ask uh, watching his work and learn about his personal life, his determinations to chronicle and writing this anthology of books that he will be sharing with us a little bit more. So with that, let's put our hands together for our, our speaker. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for your intro, Joe, and uh, thanks for inviting me to the uh, club and in this marvelous room. Uh, today's presentation is a new one, and um, you can see on the opening slide here that's a shot of my Nat Geo globe. And uh, the Great Wall is actually marked on it. And I wanted to start here from the big view. The Great Wall is a, so immense, it's a globally known feature. So today, we're actually going to find focus on one valley, a place called Jen Ko, that I have known for 25 years. I want to tell you how I found this piece of history and heaven, my enclave of antiquity, my favorite part of the Great War. And I want to tell you uh, about the wall and the landscape and some of the characters I've met there and got to know and highly respect. Okay, so... Um, uh, I took this picture about uh, 23 or 24 years ago, a magnificent sunrise, and I took this picture just last week uh, at uh, 10 past 7, beautiful winter sunrise. Uh, and I'm putting these as the header shots because for me, Jen Ko is a place that's fascinated me for a quarter of a century. No matter how many times I climb this mountain, and see this view. It's always fantastic. I always feel privileged, and I'm super excited to have guests with me to share this experience. Um, where is Jenko? Well, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Beijing, uh, actually, this map is drawn by me to show my cycling routes to the Great Wall in the 1990s, because that's how I discovered Jenko. So here's the city of Beijing as it was in the 1990s with just uh, ring road number two and number three. And at that time, I was working at China Daily, uh, going up the uh, road to uh, Huairo and into the mountains here and through the Great Wall here to Jenko. Okay. Well, we'll see uh, Jenko a bit closer. Uh, oh, that's the Chinese version. So this is our current uh, residence at Jenko, and it's a courtyard we call the barracks. And uh, we go here uh, during the weekends. 
in spring and autumn and also at special times of the year like Christmas and Chinese New Year. And I want to introduce you to the valley, the location, by uh, you joining me to draw a map. And you know, maps are kind of difficult in China. They can be quite sensitive. And whenever I'm looking for a map of the Great Wall, I can't find it. So I usually end up thinking, well, I'll just try and draw one myself. After all, I did study geography. So it all starts with a blank sheet of paper and uh, marking the wall on it. And uh, as the hours go by, after three or four days, it's taking shape. And I decide to mark the, uh, the, the wall and its twists and turns and its uh, divisions, of course. And uh, this is the road we drive into the valley. And these buildings, each building represents a village. And uh, in a moment, I'll tell you what you'll see if you go a few hundred k to the east, and what you go a few, what you'll see a few hundred k to the west. And uh, probably by that, you're thinking, this guy studied geography, and he's saying this way is the east and that way is the west. Okay, you can't catch me out. So I'll tell you what's going on in a moment. Okay, filling in the details. And this map was really fun to draw because it includes. Uh, historical place names, local place names, and also my own made-up place names, which commemorate important events. For example, Tommy's Viewpoint, where our youngest son used to like leading our guests to, uh, because, you know, he could manage that 5K, and there was a great view of the wall over here. And then, you know, you, if you've got two children, you've got to be fair, haven't you? So Jimmy, uh, Tommy had a viewpoint, so Jimmy needed a viewpoint. And you'll see Jimmy's viewpoint in a moment. And uh, important events, mm, let's find one. Okay, Flying Hat Point. That uh, refers to one morning, hands full of uh, bags of garbage, windy day, and my Fairly new Stetson, $250 and $100 for FedExing it over from the US. It just lifted off my head and flew off the wall and flew off a cliff, and I never saw it again. So I thought, well, I'm going to commemorate it. <laughs> Flying hat point. OK, the map goes on. It gets better. I uh, put it, it within a frame, and I draw some cross sections, uh, you know, the ridge line views, a bit like, you know, those Wainwright drawings in those beautiful Lakeland sketchbooks. And the map is finished. So I'll tell you where our base is, the Wild Wall Barracks since 2008. But my relationship with Genko goes back 10 years before that because we bought a farmhouse looking just like this 25 years ago in 1988. And, OK. But now I think I should tell you how someone from the other side of the world ends up living right beside the Great Wall. Well, for me, it all began in childhood. And this is my class on top of Liverpool Cathedral in 1967. That's my headmaster. Mackey, and he told us we should have a Bible, a prayer book, and an atlas beside our bedsides. And I loved my Oxford School atlas, and here I am. And as I thumbed through the atlas, I came to the map of China. And on the map of China, I spotted the castellated symbol of the wall, and I tried to measure it up. Because for me, as soon as I saw that symbol on the wall, I could see my future. I planned my own expedition from one end to the other when I grow up. And when I said to Mackie, uh, when I'm graduated from university, I want to go to China and explore the Great Wall from end to end, he said, that's a marvelous ambition, William. But you know, I don't know anyone who's ever been to China. But maybe in your lifetime, the situation would change. Well, I did my growing up, ate my spinach, ate my steak, became a good runner. Uh, I studied uh, geography. And then, me and my brothers, the Lindsay Athletic Club, 
the holders of the one generation record in the London Marathon at 227, 239 and 259. The slow coach, Nick, said to me, do you fancy a real cross country run along Hadrian's Wall? I said, yes. So I bought an OS map and I plotted the route. So it was on July the 1st, 1984, just, just after Nick took that photo of me, we stopped for a chocolate bar and he said to me, William, I think you should go to the Great Wall and run the Great Wall of China. 1984, do you remember those golden 1980s in this part of the world? You know, Deng Xiaoping, the reforms, everyone is full of hope. And me, on the other side of the world, I had heard people had gone to China and returned. So I thought, why not? Age 28, no loves or loans or little ones to hold me back. I'm going and I'm trying to become the first foreigner to make a journey along the Great Wall on foot. And I had a great adventure. So now, if you can remember that map, we're going to the right, to the west, to, from Beijing, over the Yellow River, to the Silk Road, the Hershey Corridor in Gansu, a place called Jiayiguan, and that's where the western end of the Ming Dynasty Great Wall stands. That's the Great Wall as the world knows it today. And it's made of mud. And I took that picture before setting off on my journey. And this picture I took on the self-timer. I mailed the film back to Beijing. My contact, Mr. Brown of Midland Bank, mailed it to the UK. And uh, then it re was received by my, my, my brother. He printed it and he sent the pictures to the Telegraph, the Times and the Guardian. So it took two months to arrive in British newspapers. Yeah. And uh, here's some of the press cuttings running along the Great Wall from pub promise to practice. Oh, well, as you can see, I met some interesting people. So I'm not here to talk about my 1987 adventure. But what I'll say is it was a major physical, political, and romantic adventure. Why physical? 2,500K on foot. That was not difficult for me as a marathon runner. Why political? Because most of China was closed to foreigners at that time. I don't know whether some of you remember. You got a Chinese visa, but you could only go to a few hundred pinpricks on the map. And the other places in between were all closed to foreigners because they didn't have anything of interest for tourists or businessmen. Okay, so I was stopped, arrested, apprehended by the police nine times. But they were so naive, they never met a serial foreign trespasser of China before. All the receipts for the fines I paid are number 001. <laughs> I was even deported, and Hong Kong plays a major part in my story, because I came here, out of China, and I returned with a new passport to continue my journey. So thank you, Hong Kong. Why a romantic adventure? I should go back. Because uh, in the course of being deported, I met a young lady by the name of Wu Qi. And uh, well, love at first sight, first marriage proposal after two weeks. <gasps> but you're a foreigner. Second, after a month. My mother thinks foreigners are spies. Third request, well, we'll try. And um, we've been getting on quite well in the last 35 years. And my wife is here today. Thank you. OK, the story is told in Alone on the Great Wall. And this is the journey I made from Jiayiguan in the west. This is the place I was deported from. And I returned here and continued to Old Dragon's Head, where the wall meets the sea. And lo and behold, little did I know that 35 years later, our children would 
make their own journey along the Great War. I mean, you know when you have children, you always want them to do better than you in most things. <laughs> but they did better than me in a big thing. They clocked up 3,800 kilometers along the wall, following in my footsteps and beyond. My journey was an adventure beyond anything I ever imagined because China was close to foreigners. But their adventure was mega because they did it in 2022 when China was close to foreigners and Chinese because of COVID. <laughs> How amazing is that? Right. And they arrived at uh, Old Dragon's Head and they had this picture of Dad taken in 1987 and they found the exact spot. But they weren't satisfied with that. They wanted to go to the true eastern end of the wall, which is Dandong on the Korean border. But they got bogged down, locked down, arguing with the police. So they had to retreat to Beijing and wait. And they returned to finish the last 600k in June. And Wu Qi and I went to Dandong, you know, on the Yellow River overlooking the Korean border to meet them. And I took this photograph. Okay, so this is the journey they made, Jiayi Guan to Shanghai Guan, and then all the way here to Dandong on the Yalu River border with Korea. So they beat me by about you know, 1,300K. What's that among family members? Okay, right. The Great Wall, it's very confusing. There's not one Great Wall of China, there's 16. I put this slide in to show you all of these colored lines, 16 different Great Walls of China, built between 300 BC and 1644. But my story, my journey, my piece of the Great Wall, Jianko, is on the Ming Great Wall. And I discovered Jianko by bicycle. Here I am with Qi. The kingdom of the bicycle, we used to use bicycles for getting around town. It was the best means of transport. You know, there were no taxis, buses were filthy, smoky. And then Giant opened a bike store in Beijing. And in 1994, I went in and I said, I want that. 999 yuan. It was their top bicycle. And it changed my life because I would spend 30 weekends a year cycling out north of Beijing to different parts of the Great Wall. So the Beijing region, that's one of nine provincial level admin regions that the Ming Wall crosses on its journey across North China, has 400 kilometers of Great Wall, Ming Wall, and it's the best wall of the whole length because it was built to protect the capital, Beijing, to its immediate south. So it's in the course of these cycling expeditions to the wall, I first of all came up with the term wild wall, because my colleagues at China Daily said, what are you doing every weekend going to the Great Wall? I mean, it's so touristy. We only go there if we have to take out of town visitors. I said, are we talking about the same place? I never see anyone. Look at my pictures, look, here, look, yeah. They said, oh, your Great Wall is all broken down and needs fixing. And I said, oh, I, see, I get where you're coming from. You're thinking about tourist wall, whereas my love is wilderness wall, wild wall. And it's this road that led me to the new chapter in my story, because I saw this farmhouse. I went back and said to Uti, can you go out and try and buy it? She said, what? <laughs> so we bought this house for 10,000 yuan. We repaired it for probably 5,000 yuan, and it changed our lives. Family finally visited us to have a free holiday at the Great Wall. That's my brother and his son, my nephew. Yeah, and here it is, our farmhouse. And you know that picture with the clouds at the beginning and the sunrise? It's one and a half kilometers up this gully. We are the closest building to that fabulous site. And as friends and family uh, uh, realized we had a place here, they 
came and visited, and I'd like to introduce this Norwegian guy, Shell Stenstervold. He said to me, William, what are you doing in Beijing? And I said, well, you know, I'm working at, uh, I did work at China Daily, and then I moved over to the state news agency, the features department. It's away from all the political stuff. Um, and uh, Shell said to me, there he is helping me pick up garbage. He said to me, you should be earning your living by telling visitors how you have experienced and discovered the Great Wall of China. And that was a very good piece of advice. I was 42, I was fed up going to an office and being told what to do, and I thought it's high time I spent all of my time, every day, doing what I love the most. So, in the year 2000, in the year 2000, uh, we decided to go Great Wall full time. And I want to slow down here because at this point, going to the same place weekend after weekend allowed me to really savor the magnificence and the significance of the location. I think it was the Irish poet Patrick Cavanna said, in a lifetime, you can only know one small field, one piece of land intimately, and it's depth that counts, not amount that counts. So you see, these places, they look different in different seasons. The winter's over, the blossom comes out, the first rainfall brings this beautiful, vivid greenery. And then it starts to fade, and the autumn comes, and before you know it, it's winter. So these views I have enjoyed by myself and with guests have really allowed me to think about how important this monument, former defense, is. And we're now at Jimmy's viewpoint. I think it's one of the most beautiful viewpoints of a handful of panorama points in the valley. And you can see how the landscape of the Great Wall changes from season to season. Yeah. That was taken almost a year ago, uh, late November. Yeah. Right. The beauty of the Great Wall is not appreciated by everyone. 25 years ago this year, I led the first band of volunteers to pick up garbage on the Great Wall. And it was my entry action into becoming known as a Great Wall preservationist. So uh, I've put this in as like a marker, well, 23 years ago. So the baby there, Tommy, uh, he's now 23. And the, the big lad there, he's now 29, that's Jimmy and Tommy. They're also um, Great Wall fanatics. We're a family of walnuts, you know, walnuts. Yeah. Okay. And there's Chi, yeah. Uh, and uh, after arriving at Genko, I thought, wow, what a miracle this section is. It's like two hours' drive from Beijing, but there's this enclave of antiquity that's preserved so perfectly just a stone's throw from that mega city. And I thought, wow, I read in the paper that Zhu Rongji has said that the automotive industry is going to become a pillar industry of China. And I thought, what happens when just a few Chinese have cars and they drive out, as I used to cycle out, and they discover the wild wall? Are they going to pick up garbage? I thought, not many of them. So I thought, I better do something about it. So we did. We came up with the Countryside Code, adapted from you know, the Keep Britain Tidy campaign that I experienced when I was a lad. And we got uh, recognition from the World Monuments Fund. And we had the Great Wall landscape in the Beijing region listed as one of the world's 100 endangered sites by the New York-based conservation organization. And this helped move Great Wall conservation up the national agenda. 
and we employed a team of farmers to work as rangers in the valley, picking up garbage from the paths, from the wall. And we put these notices, the green message signage, take nothing but photos, leave nothing but footprints, at, at important points in the valley. And they're still there 25 years later. I'm now going to introduce uh, my favorite ranger, um, uh, the old man there, uh, Chang Jin Wang. Oh, by the way, this is the path that leads from our farmhouse up to the ridge line of the wall. And uh, Chang Jin Wang, of our whole ranger team, he was the best ranger. But how could he be the best ranger when he was like 84 years old? Actually, when I said to him, you know, uh, hey, uh, uh, Chang Lao Tao, ni shen me shi chu sheng, uh, when were you born? He said, well, bu jida. Yeah, he doesn't know when he's born, but we think he was in his 80s. And he did a great job because, you know, his family, the other villagers thought, this 80-year-old old head is, is past it. His life's over. He's no use. He's just pottering around the garden, you know, shop, playing, playing with sticks. But we gave him a job, and he did his job so conscientiously, every day, he was up there with a bag, picking up garbage. If he saw anyone throwing litter, he would say, oh, you shouldn't do that. And he was abused. Some really, you know, male shaping, uh, low-level people from Beijing would say, if we don't throw garbage, you don't have a job. And I said to Lao Chang, you should tell them they should stop throwing garbage, and you will still have a job down in the village, telling people your stories. Yeah, so here he is, the Star Ranger. But the younger men in the team, any word of some other work down the valley, they'd go and do that. And they put picking up garbage for me on the bottom of the list. I had to sack a couple of them because they didn't do any work. That's the important thing I learned about employing rangers at the Great Wall. Uh, Chang Jinwang has passed away. I think if he was still alive today, he'd be about 93, 95. But uh, about a year before he passed away, we decided he'd been such a key international friend of the Great Wall, which is the name of the society I established here in Hong Kong to formalize my actions at the Great Wall, uh, I said to him, you are the Star Ranger. So we gave him a, a, a reward, a new fridge and a photo. I, I said to him, let's give him a photo. And she said to me, Chinese people like something useful, not just a gong on the wall. <laughs> yeah, so he's, uh, yeah, I think the fridge is still working. Right. Now, I met a man of supreme significance, also at Genko, from the other side of the world. And it began with a letter from Marjorie in Britain, who'd read my book. And she said, I have another book about the Great War, written by an American, written 80 years ago. And I'm old now. I would gladly send it to you. So she sent me the first book ever written about the Great Wall of China anywhere. And I emphasize anywhere. Even the Chinese had not written a, a, a book dedicated to the Great Wall. And I thought to myself, I was William the Conqueror. And I realized, demoted, <laughs> William II, because William Guile made a journey along the Great Wall in 1908. OK, he was riding horses and then ascending the wall here, walking along it, and then joining the, the horses again. But you know, 80 years later, no one cares the means. He's the first person to make the journey. But I soon realized that we weren't really contenders. We could be cooperators, because we'd taken the same photo in the same place. Yeah, in his book, this is his 1908 photo. And there he is, standing, sitting on the wall. But when I got there, 79 years later, this is the photo in my Alone on the Great Wall, published in 1989. You can see the tower that was stood, was standing behind William Guile. It had gone by the time I was there. And this made me think how valuable old photos were. And it would eventually precipitate 
a full photographic uh, documentation project of what we call re-photography, you know, uh, then and now, side by side. You don't need to say anything. It's moving. It makes people, you know, it makes them brokenhearted. Where's the wall gone? And this is what I wanted to trigger among the viewers. So I didn't realize when I received William Gar's book that he had walked through our valley and stayed with the great-grandfather of the lady who cooks meals for us. Can you believe that? Okay. So it's the wall of two Williams story began at Jenko for me. And uh, Guile took a magnificent panorama from the top of this mountain. And here I am, I think this is about 2005. That looks like my Leica M6 film camera and I'm replicating his earlier shot. And uh, back to the map. So I want to tell you how William Guile came into the valley. He set off from a village here, and the mule train couldn't come along the wall, so they were on a mule track leading to the village here. And he took photos here, here, and here. And it was a Sunday, so he stayed in this village here, and he wrote some very poignant sentences, including, here at the Thistle Ravine, the combination of the ancient building and the serene nature is unimaginable. He wrote, after seeing this landscape, I wouldn't bother to cross the road to see the pyramids, which I think is a bit of overpraise because the pyramids are awesome and they're 4,600 years old, whereas the wall here is only about 450 years old. But you see, folks, what I want to impress upon you today one, it is one thing. The Great Wall is more than history, it's ge geography, geography. And no other world wonders can compare with the Great Wall's geography. Okay, so William Gall passes through our valley, and I get to know him, and I retake many of his photographs. So let's have a look at some of his photos and the retakes. Rebuilt here. That's rebuilt. A lovely three shape. So actually, not huge changes in this area. Um, so here I am in the courtyard of the barracks. So, you know, over the years, we've, we've got the farmhouse and we've moved up in the world. We've acquired the broken down old school of the valley and we've made it a courtyard where we receive guests and also give classes to visiting students. And, uh, well, the Wall of Two Williams projects it went on uh, getting bigger and better, and eventually it impressed the Beijing government so much they gave us a venue at their top museum for an exhibition for six weeks in uh, the year 2007. Yeah. And that exhibition has now been shown in 10 places across China. It's still showing in Jiayiguan, and the local government has asked us for an outdoor exhibition next year to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Deng Xiaoping saying, love China, rebuild the Great Wall. Yeah. Another thing William Guile wrote about Jenko in his book was uh, the botanist could fill his sample books in this valley alone. And Guile noted it was a beautiful basin topography, sheltered from the in the north by a 1,600 uh, meter high mountain. And I must admit, one of the, another of the great beauties of seeing one location throughout the year, year after year, is being delighted by the diversity of the flora. Yeah. I'm sure many of you have wall gardens, you know, a few rocks, the rock plants, but this is also a wall garden. Uh, 
I've forgotten what this one is called, but it reminds me of Lily of the Valley. The, the uh, lilac is supreme in May. It's like a botanical clock. May the 15th, plus or minus three days, the fragrance of the lilac on the wild wall at Jenko is intoxicating. So beautiful. Yeah. And there's lichen and these little plants surviving in the little nooks and crannies. Yeah, it really is a beautiful sight. And this is a bit like polyanthus, you know, growing among the bricks. So it's the wild wall that's been claimed by nature uh, since the Great Wall of the Ming was abandoned, you know, by the Manchu in the, in the 1640s. It's this that many visitors, Chinese and foreigners alike, think this represents the true soul and spirit of the Great Wall. And, you know, I, as I get older, I'm starting to appreciate, you know, the vintage look, the gray hair, the, the, the wrinkles, and, you know, the kind of stiff back. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, so now let's uh, soak in some of these supreme views, and then I want to finish off by telling you how you can experience the Great War with me, uh, my sons, and my wife, uh, hopefully in the near future. These magnificent views looking east and west. And I should explain at this point why that map I showed you is like upside down. Because that map is drawn specifically for using in our valley. So when you hold that map in our courtyard, it's oriented correctly. Yeah. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, it's all magnificent. And maybe the battery is failing. Yeah, OK. So, Jen Ko. Right, what's happening? In recent years, archaeologists have been excavating the rubble. And in the next sequence, uh, you can see uh, the rubble and excavated, and what they found in the rubble. They found some interesting things that tell us exactly when the wall was built, including inscribed tablets. They usually start on the top right. They tell you, you know, in the X year of the reign of the Wanli Emperor, a section of first-class border wall uh, measuring so many Jiang meters was built during the spring season. So these are very revealing archaeological finds. And uh, this is one of the new things happening on the Great Wall, a lot happening at the moment. The Chinese government is trying to construct a national park, which is actually a chain of highly significant places along the whole length of the Great Wall. And uh, uh, the archaeologists are our good friends, and last uh, year they showed us one of the prize finds, this ridge end uh, from one of the uh, tower uh, sentry posts. And you can see the scale of this chuva. Good. OK. Experiencing the Great Wall with William. Let's uh, go back there. The Wild Wall Weekend. This is our signature trip. We've been doing it for 25 years. They're all the same timing, Friday evening to Sunday lunchtime. Two dawn walks. If you don't like getting up early, come in midwinter. Sunrise is 7.45. If you're an early bird, Come in midsummer. Sunrise is 4:38. Yeah, and uh, you'll meet other like-minded people, and you'll see the Great Wall that you couldn't possibly imagine existed. Yeah, and uh, we're based now at the barracks. We've got the countryside code written on the wall. Here's the main room where we eat and we give talks. So the talks might be from me, Jimmy. Tommy, 
uh, the uh, luxury accommodation. Yeah, we've got all mod cons like running water, flush toilets, and uh, even Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've mentioned two dawn walks, yeah, and uh, I think over the years, no one has ever refused to go on a dawn walk, yeah, and this is just uh, a few weeks ago, yeah, 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 there's Tommy uh, explaining something of great significance, yeah, yeah, and uh, from time to time, we have a very special guest, and I'd like to introduce Yang Fuxi. So his family have been making bows for nearly 500 years. And his family was behind the invading Manchu army that conquered over through the Ming in 1644. And he is the only traditional bow maker left in China today. He has been designated an intangible cultural heritage. Here's some of our... This is from the trapped expat travel era of 2022, you know, when the expat couldn't leave Beijing, and we managed to do a few trips. So I think everyone there is either a diplomat, an international school teacher, or working for a German car maker. <laughs> the only foreigners left in Beijing at the time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, sometimes I must admit, we relax and we go out at uh, sunset, and we have a glass of champagne up on the wall. Champagne with a view, hard to beat. Yeah, savor the moment. Yeah, and food, all the, uh, the management of the house is uh, uh, under the uh, 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 guidance of my wife, Chi. Yeah, yeah, the barracks in summer. Okay, so we had to be more creative about Wild Wall during these COVID years because we had to attract those trapped expats. So we came up with two trips. One is a, a trip in Hebei province, which is 50 towers, uh, walking through 50 towers over 10k and three gorges. And uh, we stay in a farmer's lodge on uh, the first night. And on the second night, after the 10k hike, we camp beside the wall and we have delicious food. So let's look at some of the images. This is the farmer's lodge tucked right under the wall. So this is a, a three-hour drive from Beijing. Um, so we can leave Beijing about one in the afternoon on the Friday. And uh, yeah, beautiful towers. There's Jimmy with some of our guests. Beautiful hiking. Great food along the way. That's an aerial shot of the uh, final kilometer to the campsite. The towers are packed. Yeah, stark and full square. Yeah. And uh, very good camping equipment. Right beside the wall. Ready to ascend the wall and enjoy the sunrise over this string of towers. Yeah. And uh, what, what more could you ask for? Cheese omelette and bacon and freshly brewed coffee for breakfast. Okay, now, I must admit, my favorite tour now is in the Northwest. And uh, this tour, Ruins of Desert Cathay, takes you to some of my favorite places. They're remote, they're inaccessible. I can only take you there because I've established very good friends and contacts, people who can drive land cruisers through the desert to take us to these amazing places. So where do we visit? We start, we start uh, here in Baotou, and we go to the first Great Wall of China, 2,200 years old, the Qin Wall in the mountains, uh, the Yin Mountains, mentioned by Sima Tian in his records of the Grand Historian. And then we take an overnight train across the Gobi to Urjina to see the fortress of Harahoto, half buried in sand dunes. And we see amazing trees, drought tolerant trees in the desert. You can't believe the size and the color of these beautiful trees. And then we cross the desert again to the Hershey Corridor, to Jai Guan, the very western end of the Ming Wall. And then we go to Dunhuang to see 
an ensemble of Han Dynasty Great Wall fortifications dating from 2100 BC. And then, of course, we have to visit the Caves of a Thousand Buddhas, fantastic treasure store of Buddhist art hewn into a cliff, a magnificent tour. And uh, there are actually two guests today here, uh, Susan and Willie, who came on this tour and survived the tour, uh, and are here today. Uh, it was just, what, six weeks ago or so? Yeah, yeah. So let's look at some of the images uh, by Land Cruiser to uh, the Chin Wall. We walk up this gully. Oh, there's Happy. Yeah. I hope she didn't, I didn't ask her for clearance for this photo. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so here we are in those hills, and uh, this is the first Great Wall of China, pieced together by Qin Shi Huang's army in 215 BC. Yeah, and there's, there's Willie himself there. Yeah, there we go. So this is where the Great Wall story began. And on this journey, we're traveling in the footsteps of three early 20th century explorers from left to right, Stein, Kozlov, and Guile, and uh, uh, making references to their discoveries from my study of their books from my own library, Ruins of Desert Cathay by Stein, and the, uh, the book on Harakoto by Kozlov, and the Great Wall of China by Guile. And here's perhaps the jewel of the tour, the Harakoto Fortress, which we visit at dawn to see the sunrise. And wow, this is just something else. Uh, originating from 1000 AD, it was occupied by the Tangut people for one and a half centuries. And then when the Mongols invaded, they took it. And it was the scene of the Mongols' last stand. So after the Mongols ruled China for a century or more, the Ming uh, ousted them. And there was a siege here in 1372. And uh, uh, if we do the spring tour, we have time to walk around it. Uh, this last visit, we, we, we walked around uh, part uh, and then through the middle of the, uh, of the fortress. So that's a drone shot. Uh, but here you can see what the terrain is like, these magnificent sand dunes. And of course, in the hardship of the desert, uh, uh, you, you, you need a good cup of coffee or a good cup of tea and uh, some home bakes, yeah, to improve the view, yeah. Yeah, uh, so many days uh, by land cruiser, it's really a great, uh, great trip. But not one if, you're, uh, if you suffer from seasickness. Yeah, we, we needed, yeah. Let's, let's show them the, the magnificent forest. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, it's a little bit kind of seizing up. Here we go. It's like that, isn't it? Yeah, here we go. And we visit the caves and an art school. Yeah, there we go. And uh, there will be a new segment on the next tour, the best preserved section of the Han Wall. Lectures throughout in the hotels. Okay, you can keep in contact with me on what I'm doing. Instagram, Wild Wall. Uh, YouTube, Wild Wall, The Great Wall 100. And the usual uh, means of WeChat and uh, website and email address. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking us through an armchair tour of the Great Wall and especially the Wild Great Wall. So I want to start off with one or two questions and then hand it to the floor and uh, follow up with other questions you may have in your mind. First, you already mentioned during the COVID years, you changed your, changed your work and changed your program. But looking forward, uh, will the tours come back and will you be continuing the same type of curations? And quote unquote, you said, the Great Wall is an open museum. So you see yourself as a docent or curator for that. And how do you want it? How do you see it in the future moving forward with the change of economics and yeah. policy? Uh, uh, 
as long as the Great Wall is there, we will be there. Yeah, as I've said before, we're walnuts. Mm. The tours are the same, but there's more choice. Yeah, so that benefits you. But I think uh, if you're thinking of uh, coming up to, uh, uh, onto the mainland for a Great Wall experience, uh, maybe start with a Wild Wall weekend. Um, if you have a uh, curiosity for some really remote places in the far northwest, then the ruins of Desert Cathay Tor is. We've only done it three times. Uh, Lonely Planet mentioned it as uh, one of the uh, most creative new tour opportunities uh, in, 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 in China. So uh, I think many of your members would enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, second question, uh, you have written 11 books yeah. and the latest anthologies of a quarter million work. How yeah. is that different from the previous book? Wild Wall, the two-volume bo uh, two box set there, that is, uh, unfolds as a very organic Great Wall story. It n naturally, you, you, by reading that, you'll see how one Great Wall project led to another. You know, my journey along the wall, and then the farmhouse, uh, meeting William Guile, uh, the conservation work, uh, then... Uh, being given a, a, a map of Mongolia and seeing, oh, there's strands of the Great Wall in Mongolia, so it's Great Wall outside China. Collecting things, you know, on the staircase, you have the big map of China. That's the Ortelius 1584 map of China, the first map uh, of China uh, published in Europe that shows the Great Wall. So that's another of my projects, Great Wall and 50 Objects. Yeah, great. Yeah. Now we'll open up questions for the floor, and anyone have any questions? Okay, we have one gentleman in the left. Have you found out why the Great Wall was built and was it successful? Uh, the Great Wall was built to defend Chinese land from nomadic invasion because uh, in uh, several centuries BC, uh, Chinese uh, land in the north of China was subject to attack by mounted warriors. So these were very skillful horsemen who used the bow and arrow from the back of a galloping horse. And the Chinese at the time didn't have cavalry of their own. So they decided to do what they're good at and avoid what they were bad at. They were bad at engaging these new enemies in open field battle. They were good at organizing, uh, being organized into large groups to undertake large construction projects with the benefit of new iron tools. And by changing the shape of the traditional enclosing wall around towns, villages, and, and cities into a linear wall of extraordinary length, they adhered to one of the basic stratagems in the art of war, to stand on the high ground and let your enemy approach you. Because in the era of cold weapons warfare, if I have height, whatever I uh, uh, launch towards you on the lower ground is going to go further and faster and I have a better chance of winning the conflict. I hope that answered your question. Any other questions? Thank you very much. That was a, a really engaging talk. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering if you could um, characterize how the current Chinese um, administration views conservation efforts versus what you've seen over your years in China? Good question. There's been a phenomenal change in the, uh, the position of Great Wall conservation on the cultural relics protection agenda. Uh, after the first Great Wall cleanup I uh, led in 1998, there was enormous press coverage. Uh, we collected all the cuttings and Chi phoned up uh, the uh, State Administration for Cultural Heritage and uh, asked for an appointment to discuss the future of the Great Wall with the Chief, chief of uh, Lawmaking at the administration. And Mr. Peng told me that, well, we haven't thought about protecting the Great Wall because, you know, China is doing so much civil uh, reconstruction of cities and towns and uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, everywhere we dig, we discover things. So there's no funding for uh, something like the Great Wall, which is inaccessible anyway to most Chinese people. 
And as soon as I heard that, I thought, uh, well, it's going to change. And I started to try and do things like, you know, I went to uh, uh, the uh, UNESCO and showed pictures of damage. And the chief of UNESCO said, hmm, this is very concerning. And I said, well, what can we do? Could we have the Great Wall of China listed as a, uh, a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site in danger? And he said to me, mm, that's probably not a good idea. It would antagonize the dragon. But he recommended I go to World Monuments Fund, and I did. And I successfully got the Great Wall landscape listed as an endangered site. That was kept fairly hush-hush on the mainland. But I think the big breakthrough in Great Wall conservation came in 2003, because the central government uh, commissioned a survey of the Ming Wall. Where is the wall? How long is it? And the result came out in 2008. The Ming Wall today remains measure 8851 kilometers. So at least from that survey, we knew where the wall was. And then the government told every province, you must stake out the ground. So for example, if you go to Ningxia or Gansu, every 200 meters, about 100 meters back from the wall, on both sides, there's a concrete plinth with a number, and it's got the words Changchong, Great Wall. So Farmer Joe, with his herd of goats, he knows that's the Great Wall. There are signs saying no herding within this zone. There are signs saying no digging of gravel and stones, no dumping of construction waste from the near side town. Uh, and the next stage has been the, uh, the identification of the most uh, significant and important type sites along the wall. So, you know, fantastic locations where the tower architecture is very well preserved. Uh, and not now just for the Ming Wall, but for the earlier dynastic walls as well. I've already mentioned the idea of the National Park, which is going to be a chain of these significant sites. And the, uh, another one uh, go running parallel to that, another scheme, is the Great Wall Cultural Belt. So, you know, the Great Wall crosses something like 212 counties of China. Um, and, you know, every county, every province, they have objects that tell specific detailed episodes of the Great Wall story there. All of these need collecting. Because the Great Wall, understanding the Great Wall, it begins with, wow, this amazing monument in this stunning landscape. But the stories lie within, you know, these characters on the bricks, these stones that the archaeologists dug up, the, uh, the function of, uh, you know, the design features, the old men in the villages and the stories they have to tell. Yeah. So all of this is being collected. So anyway, to cut the long story short, uh, in 2002, I was very pessimistic about the future of the wall. But 20 years later, I'm very optimistic. It's way up on the cultural relics protection agenda. Great question. We probably have time for one more question on, from the floor. Anyone? Gentlemen? Right here. Oh, Jeremy? Thank you, William. Incredible insight into... Um, a, a treasure of the world. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, we were just discussing, actually, that we'd seen recently that two guys had tried to uh, hack into the wall to make a shortcut to your earlier point about, um, you know, some, to some people it's a bit of a, uh, a nuisance to have mm, this wall in the way. In the way. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess my question comes back to, um, to mainland China. Your passion is very clear and your um, following and your founding is very credible and, and recognized and we've all shared in that today. But how do you think um, the educational piece can reach mainland China to actually, uh, to, to actually own um, this, this wonderful piece of, uh, of history, geography and, um, and legacy? How do you feel we can nourish the younger generations as we would say in England to um, have great respect and pride for such a beautiful um, piece of, of, of history. Yep. Yeah, good question. 
Uh, China has a population now of about 1.4 billion, and I would expect of that number, only a tiny percentage of Chinese people have actually seen the Great Wall of China. But they see it, you know, as the backdrop, President Xi welcoming uh, state leaders. They see it on postage stamps and some banknotes. But actually, to them, it's uh, maybe they don't understand the, the cultural significance. I believe uh, the future of the Great Wall depends initially on uh, experiencing it and knowing its story. Then you appreciate the, how labor-intensive the Great Wall was and how the core of the Great Wall story is a survival story. You know, the Chinese uh, society, uh, land of plenty, not quite silver spoon in the mouths of the Chinese people, but compared to the nomadic people of the north, you know, on that much harsher, windswept, infertile land, um, it's this, uh, the adjacency of these cultures that created the clash. Unless there was an equalization of wealth, you would have this uh, uh, friction. And the friction had to be solved by voluntarily uh, or violently. Actually, there's a parallel here with the migrant crisis in Europe. People leave their homes because they're in economic difficulty. And that's the case of the Great Wall story. These herders of the north, a drought, a disease, a terrible winter, they could lose all their livestock. What did they do? Their neighbors, other herders, 100K that way, 100K that way, they suffered the same disaster. All they could do was saddle up on their horses and go south. And they trespassed on Chinese land. And so the Great Wall conflict began. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, back to your question. I think the key is education and knowledge. And actually, uh, I wrote about this a few years ago. And I said, we need to have good products to excite Chinese children about the Great Wall. So an editor wrote to Chi, the writer of a blog, and uh, she said, would William write a children's book for us? And I wrote a children's book called The Golden Great Wall, which has come out this year. And uh, it's actually written with the, with the ambition of it becoming a live show. And it's a very unusual Great Wall story that uh, gives the reader a view of the Great Wall from the Chinese side, from the nomadic side, and from the global side. And it all begins in a studio in Antwerp in 1584 when a teenager is coloring a map of China to be included in the Ortelius Atlas of 1584 for the first time. And he comes to the Great Wall and he thinks, I've never seen a structure like this on any of the other maps in the Atlas, so what color should I do it? And Mr. Ortelius, the publisher of the Atlas, goes out for dinner and the boy thinks, gold. It should be colored gold. So he gets the gold paint, and Ortelius comes back and says, what are you doing with my gold paint? That's just for the titles. And the boy says, but this wall in China is so unique, it should be painted gold. And then Ortelius says, that's a brilliant idea. And if the wall is painted gold, these editions can be sold for high prices. <laughs> that's the opening scene. And the second scene is, just a few years ago, Sotheby's, London, one of these atlases is being sold. I have 250,000 pounds. 250,000 pounds from Mr. Wang. Yeah. Any, any more bids? Going, sold to Mr. Wang from Liverpool, 250,000 pounds. And Mr. Wang takes the atlas home, and his son spots the atlas. And uh, then he opens his history app, takes a picture of the atlas, and then there's a pop-up saying, by pressing this, you will be taken to China of 1584. Are you sure you want to go? And he presses it, and he begins time traveling across Europe, the Middle East, across Central Asia, back to 1584 China, where his adventure along the wall begins. Any Publishers of children's books here? <laughs> We're looking for a publisher of the English edition. <laughs> yeah. It's a great read. Incredible. Incredible <laughs> storytelling and...
thanks for taking us for a journey and a, not only visual and the storytelling incredible. So with that, thank you everyone and please do stay around, um, take a look at the book and talk to Williams. And again, with that, again, thank you for participating in our last lunch talk of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And at FCC, as usual, it's a tradition. We oh, have thank you. Thank you, Joe. Very kind of you. Look at the photo. Yeah.